Well, good morning, everyone. Hello, and really a warm welcome to all of you to New Scientist Live. My name's Josh Howdigo. I'm one of the feature editors at the magazine. And um, yeah, it's, it's really good to see you all. Sunday morning, hope you're feeling um, energized and ready for some great science. Um, now, it falls to me to uh, introduce the first speaker on the uh, future stage this morning. The only trouble is, it's a man who almost needs no introduction. He's become a household name. It's Sir Patrick Valance, the government chief scientific advisor. And of course, many of us will be familiar with him for the role he played in guiding us on COVID-19 press briefings that we had. Um, he's here today and he's going to be reflecting on some of that experience and talking about the future of science, innovation, science and innovation in the UK. Um, just before we welcome him to the stage, just a word about um, Q&A. So uh, Sir Patrick's going to speak for about 30 minutes and then we're going to have an opportunity to ask just a few questions. Um, the way we're going to do that is we're going to do it via the online platform, which is called Hopin. So if you, you should all have had details about that. If you go to that platform, and if you have any questions for Sir Patrick, post them on there, and I will read out a few of them at the end. Just try and keep them short, if you don't mind, and we'll, and we'll do the Q&A that way. So get, get your questions online. And without further ado, would you join me in welcoming Sir Patrick Valance to the stage? Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, what a fantastic place to be. And there's sort of clouds of smoke coming up from scientific experiments over there. And people obviously enjoying themselves at um, various exhibitions that I'm going to look at later on. Um, I want to talk about science, technology, and engineering and what it means for the UK. So I want to start with three observations about science, and in that I include technology and engineering, and government. So the, the first is that I think it's impossible to think of a single policy area that couldn't be impacted by science in some way or other. So if you think about the obvious ones, how we seek our health care, what our health care looks like, but also, of course, transport, and every aspect of transport has some angle of science, technology, or engineering. Where we live, how towns are designed, how green spaces are used to improve our lives. When you think about justice and how justice is administered and the role of technology in ensuring justice or being abused so that justice can't be delivered, so you look at every single aspect of government, science, technology, engineering has a part to play. The second general, and that had four main objectives. And the reason for talking to you about this is objective number one was sustaining strategic advantage through science and technology. So this is firmly on the radar of international policy, defense, and security. And it should be, because if you look at what other countries are doing, whether that's a very large country like China, whether it's America, whether it's Israel, Singapore, many European states, they are putting science and technology at the very heart of national security and resilience. I'm going to come back to resilience a bit later on. The third general reason for thinking about science and technology in government is the economy. And uh, you may have noticed that the current government seems to have uh, quite a focus on growth. And if you want growth, then you have to have science, engineering, and technology. In fact, it's pretty obvious, because if you go back to the Industrial Revolution, I mean, that was a massive spur for growth in the UK and economic development. And if you look around the world today, eight out of the top 10 companies, the biggest, fastest growing companies are science and technology companies. If you look at the NASDAQ index, so that's a share index in the US, which is full of science and technology companies, it's grown much faster than the London Stock Exchange has. And if you look at the relationship between government R&D spend and indeed overall national R&D spend, 
and productivity, you see a positive relationship. So science and technology is essential if you want growth that is above average growth. So you put those three things together. It impacts every single policy. It could be, make a difference in policy. It's important for defense, security, our safety, and resilience. And it's important for the economy. So it's clearly a matter for government, and it's a matter for us as citizens. And I think you'd conclude from that that government needs to be good at science and technology. So the obvious question is, is it any good at it? And I want to just go back a bit. I've been in this role for four and a half years, and before I took up my role, I thought I'd better find out a bit about what other people thought about science and technology inside government. And I spoke to Gus O'Donnell, who was a previous uh, cabinet secretary, so head of the civil service. And Gus O'Donnell said to me, his experience was that science was good in parts in government. It would occasionally make a difference, and it could be very important in some specific circumstances, but it isn't embedded in science, in government. He said, if you compare where science is to where economics is in government, it's inconceivable that any government department would not have a large economic sector. It's inconceivable that economists would not be involved in discussions around policy development and implementation. And so what he said to me was, you should try and make science, technology, engineering as embedded in government as economics is. And his final point was that if you go back sort of 50 or 60 years, economics wasn't embedded in government. That was a relatively new thing. It had to happen. So um, on taking up this post, we looked right the way across government at, and, and did something called the Science Capability Review. And we found a number of things. The first was that the funding for science inside government, apart from in some select departments like health and in, uh, in the Ministry of Defence, science spending had decreased over the past decade, year on year. The chief scientific advisors in individual departments, some of them were in post, some were not. And f some of them didn't have any structure around them and were not embedded in the department in a realistic way. I looked at the fast stream, and the fast stream is the way in which... Uh, Many young people join the civil service. It's a, it's a rotation. It's a graduate scheme for people to come in, get experience, and advance quickly through the civil service. And I asked a simple question, which is, what proportion of the far stream has a STEM degree? And the answer came back after a little while, 10%. Now, I don't know what the right answer is, and it's certainly the case that government needs people with arts, humanities, social sciences, all sorts of different areas, but it can't be right that 10% of the premier graduate intake scheme have STEM degrees. Another thing that we looked at was what percentage spend on research and development was taking place in departments. And in some departments, we found that it's a fraction of 1% of total spend, a very small fraction, went on research and development. Well, if you were a company and you said, I'm going to spend 0.1% on R&D, you've effectively declared yourself to be a no growth, no innovation commodity. That can't possibly be what government is supposed to be. Innovation has got to be important. And, and the final general point was the public sector research establishments, which are essentially national labs based around the country. Uh, some of them are absolutely outstanding, but there's an opportunity to get them into a better place in terms of government use. So there are a number of things there that were picked up, and, and things have improved, and, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. So the government reform agenda, which was published by the civil service a couple of years ago, uh, actually had in it this following statement. We will champion innovation and harness science, engineering, and technology to improve policy and services. That is a big step forward for the government. And civil service reform, which is going on at the moment, which is primarily a headcount reduction, has a simple question to ask itself. 
does the civil service want to be a smaller version of itself in the future, or does it want to be a differently enabled version of itself with more science and technology? And it's very clear the latter is the aim and needs to be the aim. And I'm also pleased to say that funding has gone up for science in government and that the fast stream now has a target of reaching 50% of graduates with a STEM degree, which will be incredibly important. So there are things moving in the right direction. But, and this is quite a big but, the science that goes on inside government, of course, is not the only part of the system. Indeed, you could argue it's a small part of the system. What about the other bits and what's happening to them and what needs to happen to them? Well, the first of those other areas is, of course, our foundational science base, the sort of scientists that we see here and talking in the, in the various uh, talks that have been given around the exhibition. Worth remembering, three or four out of the top ten universities in the world are based in the UK, and if you look at the top hundred, we've got many more. A few years ago, it was noted that we have 1% of the world's population, but 7% of the scientific publications come from the UK. And if you look only at the highest impact, highest ranking publications, 14% come from the UK. So we're good at it. And of course, UK Research and Innovation, which was uh, founded a few years ago, was an attempt to bring the funding agencies together to really focus on what needs to happen both within disciplines, but very importantly across disciplines, to try and enhance our research standing. And funding has increased. Um, there, there's a pledge to get to 20 billion funding by 2024-25. Uh, and UKRI is beginning to do uh, what needs to happen in terms of bringing together research funders. So my assessment on this one would be, well, that's good. We're in a, we've got a very good foundation, but we better be very careful not to lose it. It's very easy to lose, and it's very easy to forget the international presence here. We are an island, but we should not be an island in relation to science and technology. This is an international endeavor. It requires very strong international links. The other thing it requires, and I'm going to go back, I'm afraid, to the beginning of the 20th century, so um, uh, second decade of the 20th century, something called the Haldane Principle came into play. And that was a statement by Haldane about how government should think about science. And his point was that there's a lot of science which government simply needs to let happen without interfering with it. And he said decisions about which research projects to fund should be made through independent evaluation by experts based on the quality and likely impact of their research. He also said there needs to be a difference between what he calls specific research, i.e. things that a department wants to know the answer to in order to enhance its ability to deliver its departmental functions, and general research, which is the body of knowledge and exploration and creativity that comes from scientists not constrained by answering a specific question set by somebody else. That concept of the Haldane Principle has stood true for over 100 years, and is important. And indeed, it's been evolved. So in the 1970s, uh, Solly Zuckerman, who was the government chief scientific advisor, made a point about applied and basic research. In other words, the Haldane principle applies more to basic research, perhaps, than it does to applied research. But the point is, it remains an important principle. And the other development, which I think is one that, that we should all be excited about and, 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 and keep an eye on, is the new organization ARIA, which is the Advanced Research and Innovation Agency, headed by somebody recruited from overseas, Ilan Gur, which is about trying to undertake research in really difficult areas, but to do it in a way which is much more like a defined project with multiple disciplines coming together, delivering a practical answer. So ARIA, I think, is going to be an in interesting and important part of the landscape. So I've said government, I've said foundational science base. The third is companies. Most of the spend on research and development is done by companies, not by government. About two-thirds of the total spend, both in the UK and elsewhere, is company spend. And of course, that can be a major driver for growth. 
And we've got several large research-intensive companies in the UK, particularly in some sectors, so in aerospace, in uh, pharmaceuticals in particular. But nowadays, a lot of innovation and a lot of the creativity is actually occurring in small companies. It's quite different from two or three decades ago, where big companies did their own internal research and development, and that was pretty much the only source of their research and development. Nowadays, much of it is coming from startups, from small companies, and of course, academia feeding through into that. And we're good at it. We're much better at it than we were. We've got lots of startup companies in the UK now. Many universities have got spin outs and startups. And we're third in the world now for unicorns, that is, companies that have started up and have now got a valuation of greater than a billion dollars. We've had a tenfold increase in venture capital investment in these sorts of small companies in the decade from 2010 to 2020. But, and this is quite an important but, size for size, we are about three and a half times less uh, enabled by venture capital than in the US, and we are nine times less good at funding companies when they get to the stage of being about 100 million pounds. So there's a very important problem of scale up. We're good at starting companies, we've got loads of companies, they might be a little bit undercapitalized, but then, when we talk about scale up, we are failing to support them, despite the fact we've got one of the world's premier finance centers in the UK. So this all matters because innovation has to come through into products. It has to be something that benefits society, people, individual citizens. And we need to get that scale up of those high-tech science and technology companies. So what I've said is that great fundamental science in the UK, we have. We need to look after it, protect it, fund it properly, and make sure we keep an eye on the international aspects of that. I've said we're good at setting up companies but need to scale them. And that government itself is becoming more enabled in science and technology. But the key thing is not what each one in independence does, it's how do these things interconnect and how does it become a system that we can actually use to the advantage of all of our citizens. And I want to illustrate this with two examples, both of which relate to resilience, but as I'll say, they have other impacts as well. And the first of those is, of course, COVID. So in January 2020, an unknown virus emerged in China. We knew nothing about what it was. We knew nothing about its potential devastating effects that we've all seen over the last few years. What was clear, though, in January 2020, was that it would be important to get science and technology focused on this problem. And during January, we triggered a number of funding mechanisms and other mechanisms to try to get things started. We were able to pull on advice from experts ranging from public health through to behavioral science. We were able to call on mathematical modelers from multiple universities. We looked at the likelihood of the virus evolving and mutating and said, it's going to be important to get genomic sequencing, to be able to sequence the virus itself so we could see how it was changing. And a group of academics came together with one of our great research institutes, the Sanger Center in Cambridge, a big genomic sequencing center, to start up sequencing right the way across the UK, a body that then became known as COG UK. We knew that clinical trials were going to be important. How was it going to be possible to know how to treat a patient if you didn't have trials? And we had a very good trials infrastructure in the UK with many people specialized in that. And, and I want to just give an aside on clinical trials. The UK, in setting up the recovery study, which was an aim to ensure that as many patients as possible 
who caught COVID were in a clinical trial trying to work out whether something worked or didn't work with enough people in the trials to get reliable answers was the first study anywhere to work out that steroids, dexamethasone, worked. It was also the first trial that showed that lots of other things didn't work, and it continued to be important right the way through the pandemic. Across the world, thousands of clinical trials were set up. Nearly all of them were too small and didn't give definitive answers. So that ability to set up an at-scale clinical trial was down to the academic base in the UK, plus the health service, plus the extraordinary contribution from all of the people who volunteered to be in those studies. It was interesting that many people wanted to just try things out. So there was a lot of pressure from all sorts of different directions. Why not just try ivermectin? Why not try vitamin D? What could possibly be the harm? Why do you need to do a clinical trial? Surely we should just get on and try everything we've got. Most of those things, in fact, all of those things that people were asking should just be tried, turned out to be ineffective. And some of them, of course, turned out to be harmful. So the clinical trial base was really important. And then the final one, just to mention, was vaccines. The reason it was possible to get uh, vaccines started in the UK was there was an academic base working on vaccines, particularly in Oxford, but in many other places as well. So no question that a strong science infrastructure, good people working in it, world-class academics were important to try and get these things going. So what about companies? Companies were important. You take the vaccine example. It wasn't possible for Oxford to take its vaccine through into production at scale. It wasn't possible for the UK to understand all of the things going on around the world in vaccines without industrial experts, people who had actually taken things through to products, people who understood scaling up a very difficult scientific and engineering problem. How do you turn something from a laboratory scale to thousands or millions of doses? People who knew the pitfalls, people who were able to bring industrial expertise to bear on this problem. And the fact that we were able to link Oxford and AstraZeneca in the country meant that quite quickly the whole thing could get going at an industrial scale. And importantly, and I think this is something that, that is, is, you know, is, is worth recognising, AstraZeneca agreed to do all of that at cost. So they didn't make any money. Many other companies made lots of money, but they didn't. That was possible because we had the companies in the UK. So I don't think we would have had any of the vaccine success that we had if we hadn't had experts from industry involved in this, as well as academics and others. The same is true of uh, treatments, the, the drug treatments, and the only reason the clinical trial infrastructure was so good was, again, because there were links through into industry. And it's worth just reflecting. We were good on the vaccine side. We were good on the therapeutic side. We were less good on the testing side. It took quite a long time to be able to ramp up testing. Why was that? Well, in part, because we don't really have a resident diagnostics industry in the UK. Germany has lots of diagnostics industry and we're able to do that quickly. So this interplay between what you have in academia and what you have in industry is important. And then the third part, again, of course, is government, which had a lot of things to do, and I'm not going to go through uh, those, but I'm going to just pick out a few things. The first is that the operational science, the ability to turn the science into practical things for the population, was, of course, uh, Public Health England's duty. And um, underfunding a Public Health England for a decade, I think, is something that is, is an important thing to think about in terms of future preparedness for any pandemic. And there will be a future pandemic, for sure. The Office for National Statistics, which is a government body, was fantastic at setting up a survey that allowed us week on week to understand what was happening with the infection. Many countries around the world looked at that and said, we can't do that here. We haven't got something like the ONS that can do it. So these funding of these bodies which exist all the time is crucial. 
The medicines and healthcare regulatory authority, the regulators, were important because they became involved in vaccines, not at the end when somebody had a vaccine, but at the beginning when it was a twinkle in the eye. They behaved very differently from regulators normally, and they got involved from the beginning and became the regulator that was the first one in the world to approve a vaccine. That was because they had experts and they were involved from the beginning. And this notion that government has a part to play in this continues. Government must have a role to understand long COVID and what's happening now to many people around the country. And I want to give a rather sort of unexpected example of where science funded through government is going to have another difference. And it was an example I saw at the Natural History Museum last week. The Natural History Museum has a collection of all sorts of things, as you know, but it's got a collection of bats going back a long time. So people have found bats in various caves from around the world and samples have been sent to the Natural History Museum and they've been in a store in the Natural History Museum. And I was fortunate enough to be uh, spoken to by a guy called Roberto who is an absolute bat enthusiast and he showed me all of this collection. And what Roberto has been doing with colleagues around the world is asking the question, with these collections in museums, could we take tiny tissue samples and might you be able to detect coronavirus in those tissue samples and might you therefore understand something about where coronavirus has been over the past couple of hundred years and how it's evolved. It's early days, but that's the sort of thing, the unexpected benefits of having a strong science system that might give insight for how this virus behaves in the future. So that example, the COVID example, is a resilience example, but it's also a growth example because as a result of the way things were able to be done with vaccines, industry has started investing in the UK again. And of course, it's an integration example with the primary uh, example of that being the Vaccines Task Force, which was set up precisely in order to integrate. Integrate research, development, manufacturing, procurement. All of those things needed to come together. And Kate Bingham did a brilliant job of doing that to make sure that we could pull all of the things together to make a product and, or, to, or to procure a product. So let me um, turn from COVID to a second example. And the second example, if COVID was a huge global challenge and a massive tragedy for many people and a big disruptor of lives all around the world, it was a two or three year major problem with a long tail of problems. The problem I want to give as my second example is a multi-decade long-term problem for all of us, and that, of course, is climate. This is the big challenge that governments face around the world. It is one that is fundamentally dependent on science and technology. So what about our fundamental research base? For sure, we need to invest in research for mitigation, i.e. how do we stop our carbon emissions and adaptation. How are we going to adapt to the things that are already happening and we know will get worse, whether that's heat waves, wildfires, uh, extreme flooding? We know that this is going to get worse. Sea level rising over the last few decades show us. So we're going to need to make sure that that side of things is properly funded. And indeed, think about things like sub-kilometer scale weather forecasting and the ability to understand what the impacts are going to be at a local level, because adaptation is often a very context-specific issue. It's going to need research in physics, right the way through to social and behavioral science, and it's going to need a lot of investment in new technologies. And that's where companies come in. Think about the scale at which things need to be done for net zero. It's quite easy to talk about things like heating in a house, change your boiler. Well, that's not easy when you get it up to millions 
It's not easy to think how you do retrofit in houses at big scale. It's not even easy to think about how you get an infrastructure for electric vehicles that works effectively right the way across the country. If you start at 2050 and work backwards, given how long it takes to scale things, we haven't got 20 years to find solutions. We have to make decisions in the next two, three, four years in order to then scale them effectively over the next period to get to this solution. So this is an immediate problem. It's an immediate challenge. We can't rely on a magic invention of a new technology. We should absolutely continue to invest and explore new technologies, including things like fusion as a source of energy. But we need also to focus now on the technologies that we can see or we can feel are nearly there and ask the question, how do they get enhanced? How do they get scaled? How do they get implemented, deployed, tested in living test systems? So this, I think, is a big science and tech challenge which ranges from discovery through to implementation. It's also a growth story. There is a multi-trillion dollar market in green technology, and people who are good at it will make more than people who aren't good at it. And so it's not all cost. Even if you wanted to take a narrow view you'd say you should still do this because it will ultimately benefit the economy as well. Not doing it, by the way, not sorting it out, will damage the economy enormously. So where does government fit into this? Well, it definitely fits in as a funder of these things and the need to keep them going, but it also fits in as a mission driver. So I've talked about the Vaccines Task Force. What are the missions like that that we need to do for net zero? It acts as an integrator of these bits, and it has to act as that integrator. And fundamentally, this is a systems problem for government. It's a systems engineering problem. Not engineering in the sense of pipes being put together, but engineering in the sense of so many different moving parts which all interact and can potentially offset each other. And so my argument is that government needs a central systems engineering approach to this with the ability to visualize it and see what needs to be done by what, when. And this is a very urgent need in government. It also links, of course, to biodiversity, the loss of species right the way across the world. Those two things are linked, and we need to make sure we link them when we think about policy solutions. So let me start drawing this to a close. Science and technology is crucial for the country. We're good at it and it impacts lots of different parts. It is therefore, in my opinion, fundamentally a prime ministerial accountability. It's an all of government issue. It's not something just for a science department, Department for Transport, Department for Education, Depart Ministry of Justice, the Department for Leveling, Leveling Up and Communities. All of them need to have science and technology at their heart. It needs a consistent and long-term view. It's not something that can chop and change. If you chop and change, this doesn't get done because most of the science and technology takes years to come through and decades to get right in terms of the ability to implement it. It needs consistency across governments. It can't be done in a single parliamentary term. It needs all of the levers that governments have to be used. Finance, funding, regulation, procurement, and of course, skills. And it requires us as citizens to demand this in the sense that the problems that we have, whether it's at a local level, a national level, or international level, have science and technology solutions. And the more we can frame the problems in those terms, the more, of course, politicians everywhere take notice of it. So I think the formation recently of the National Science and Technology Council as an inter-ministerial body designed to ask the question, how does all of government make sure this can happen, is a major step forward. And I think what needs to be seen is that for any future government or prime minister, this ought to be on a par with the National Security Council.
You can't imagine a government not having something like a National Security Council. You shouldn't be able to imagine them not having something like the National Science and Technology Council. It is fundamental to our future. And my final point is around people. None of this is possible without people. We need skills. We need inspired young people in schools. We need them to understand that science is not just the body of facts, which is difficult to know. Nobody can know it. It's a method, a way of thinking, a way of experimenting and answering questions. And in order to be successful, we need both to be international and we need diversity and inclusion. These are really difficult problems. You don't tackle difficult problems by monolithic cultures, by everybody looking the same, coming from the same background, having the same thought process. So diversity and inclusion, and we're not good at it in science, technology, and engineering, 16% of graduates are female in the UK. That isn't good enough. We have to make sure that we make ourselves diverse, not just because of a social, moral, ethical reason, but because fundamentally, it's how you can be much better at addressing the difficult problems that we have. I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, so we're going to just ask you a couple of questions, yeah, sure. if that's still OK. Sorry. Um, so they've been coming in on our online platform. And I think it's fair to say a lot of the, a lot of the questions are, are how questions. You know, you were talking a lot about some of the things we need to do. Um, I'll read this first one out for you. So it says, science often means telling politicians that things aren't possible. Or I guess that must be true sometimes. Um, in recent years, this seems to have seen the perception of experts weakened in public eyes. How do we get the balance shifted back in the right direction so that scientists are revered or at least viewed as vectors of progress rather than naysayers? <laughs> nice easy one for you yeah. to start well, with. Well, I, I think, uh, look, I, I don't think it's the job of a scientist actually to tell a politician what to do or not to do. I mean, there's a democratic system that elects people to make those decisions. But the job of science is to make sure that the information is adequate for people to make the decision and the consequences of those decisions with the uncertainty is understood. So, you know, for me, there are four things that science needs to do. One is ask the question, is the evidence base good enough? And if not, what are we going to do about it? Has that evidence base been adequately understood? That's important because it's not good enough to say, well, I wrote it in a paper, therefore you should know it. You've got to make sure it's understood. The third is, does the evidence allow somebody to look at policy options and operational options within the uncertainties? Where are the uncertainties? And the fourth is, and this is where science can play a really big part, how do we monitor against that? And that's obviously true for net zero, but many things. So I think if we take those four areas, that's what we need to keep doing. And key to that is understanding in politicians. I mean, you know, again, most politicians don't come from a scientific background. And so you, most of them think science is a yes or no subject, whereas we all know actually science advances by overturning previously held truths. And um, for a politician, if you say, actually, we've now got new evidence that tells us that's not right, it looks a bit more like this, that's, that's bread and butter for us. It, unfortunately, it's what's known as a U-turn in politics and often in the media. So I think that's quite an important thing that we need to really speak about very openly about how science actually works and advances. Yeah, I mean, I think for those of us, the, the sort of people who read New Scientist, we sometimes like to think that, you know, if only politicians just followed the science a bit more, everything would be fine. Not, not as simple as that necessarily. Um, just a couple more for you then. Um, so at the end of the talk, you talked about diversity and you said we're not good at it in this country. Um, a question here which just says, how do we get more women involved in creating these, those innovative startups that you yeah. talked about? Yeah, I, I, I didn't say we're not good at it in this country. I specifically said we're not good at it in science, technology and engineering, not as good as we should be. And I think, you know, we're probably not as good at it in the country as we should be either. But I, my point was a, a narrower one. Um, I think the Royal Academy of Engineering has done a brilliant job of trying to get 
uh, more girls and, and young women into uh, engineering. I think they, their campaign was really pretty good and it did have an effect. So we know that you can change this. And we also know that if you look at science and technology startups, they don't just require physical scientists, biological scientists, whatever it might be. They also require social scientists and others, and actually people from arts humanities. So there's, there's two things. How do you get more people to do STEM degrees? Very important. But also, how do you get more people drawn into this as actually a really exciting thing to be part of, where they'll bring other um, examples? And, and again, I'll give you an example from the Natural History Museum. I was shown round last week on a digitization program of their collections. They're trying to digitize all of their collections going back you know, 200 years of Beatles and so on. The person who showed me round was a fine arts graduate. So she was coming at this from a sort of question of how do I make sure that I've got the right picture for somebody to be able to use? So I think there's a role here for everybody in this, and that's where we need to work on as well as increasing the STEM. Very interesting. Sorry. I'll just ask you one last one, Patrick, and um, it, this is one from me. I was interested when you mentioned ARIA, the new um, research organization or research funding model, sort of based on the US kind of ARPA-DARPA um, model. Um, I just wondered, for those people who don't know too much about that, I wondered if you could perhaps say a bit about what what that is and where we are with it and why you sounded like you were quite optimistic about it could you say could you tell us a bit about why so, so let me go back aria which, um, so arpa which was the advanced research projects agency in the u.s i think was founded in the 1950s or something like that and its idea was to take really difficult questions and try and turn them into something positive it then became darpa which was focused on defense it then became oh, they've got several of them uh, intelligence, energy, health, and so on. But the idea of the initial one was, let's take the big problems and put engineers, scientists, business, academia, others together to try and tackle these big problems. And the example I love more than any was um, Treasury in the US said, here's a question for you. I think it was in the 1960s. Um, you keep asking us, every department keeps asking us to buy bigger and bigger computers every year can't you get these machines to speak to each other? Aria took, ARPA, ARPA took that question away and actually said, well, you we probably can get them to speak to each other. That led to the formation of the ARPANET, which then became the internet. So that's the sort of question I think that you need to think of. How, how are these big questions posed? Aria is a UK version. It won't be the same. It can't be the same. It's not focused on a specific area, but it's got the same concepts of a lot of freedom to operate differently, a lot of ability to pull in people from different sectors and fund them, and a project management approach to trying to get some of these questions answered with a sort of acceptance that nine out of ten things will fail. So it's a sort of um, fail fast and, and uh, make yeah. progress that way. Well, look, we, we're out of time, I think, for our talk today, so we'll have to wrap up there. But, um, Patrick, thank you so much for Pleasure. speaking to us. It's so interesting to get your insights. Um, so let's, let's close by just uh, thanking Sir Patrick Vallance again. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much.